men have always gotten to do things first. So by sheer numbers, more men have been doing comedy for longer because women for so long were expected to stay home, have children, and then die. All right, we got a funny lady coming to the stage right now. Let's make some noise for her. I've been intro like the fact that I'm a woman is like a wacky experiment. They'll be like, we got a young lady coming up. Yeah, like, let's see how this goes down. We are socialized not to say the things that we want to say. We're not allowed to show that we're angry, even though we are. But we have to keep a smile and not show it because of wrinkles and likability. Because if she's angry, she's hysterical. Difficult, bitchy. Diva. <laughs> and it's like, see, crazy. And if someone's crazy, of course you don't have to listen to them or take them seriously. Because I've eaten ass, I know I am a woman who can do anything. You can be very pretty and be funny. The only requirement is that you feel ugly on the inside. Don't walk, don't run, don't Just make them feel like their bodies are unacceptable and then like sell them some shit. I wanted to be successful at this and, and if that meant don't eat, I just was fine with that. You have the mic, it's your turn. You have control. Right before I got on stage, a woman went, you know it's Harvey Weinstein, right? I didn't know that we have to bring our own maze and uh, rape whistles. <laughs> that was fearless. One of the coolest things I've ever seen. I'm seeing a lot of badass girls get into this field. Once you stand up against power, the narrative changes. We're all fueling each other, and it's becoming something bigger. Strong black woman, that never felt like a compliment. That always felt like work. Like, hey, what you doing on Saturday? I got this heavy couch. I need a strong black woman. Hi, this is Melanie McFarland. I'm the TV critic for Salon.com, and today I'm delighted to be moderating the panel for Hysterical, an intimate documentary look at the uh, lives and careers of women in comedy today, as told through some of the most in-demand stand-up performers that are working right now. And with me today, I have the tremendous pleasure to introduce director Andrea Nevins. Hi, everybody. <laughs> and her fellow executive producer uh, and comedian, Jessica Kearson. Hi. <laughs> and with us today, we have four of the very funny women featured in Hysterical. We have Fortune Famester. Hey. Rachel Feinstein. Hi. Marina Franklin. What up? <laughs> Sherry Shepard. Is this my Bumble date? <laughs> Hi, I'm single. <laughs> Can't help you right now with that, but oh, we'll do our best. <laughs> and Eliza Schlesinger. Feels natural. <laughs> Feels really natural. <nice. laughs> Thank you. All right, let's dive in here. I want to start with a very basic question for Jessica and Andrea. What inspired you to make this documentary? And when did you first go into production? Yeah, so I actually was doing stand up at a comedy club in New York City called Stand Up New York. And an advertising agency was there and they saw me perform. And I started meeting with them. They wanted to do a, a movie about stand up comedians. And it never panned out, but we connected with Campfire and um, and then, you know, brought the deal to FX and, and got the deal to make the movie. And then, uh, thank God, brought Andrea on, who is so amazing. Um, and then really it, it went from there. I just, you know, work with all these women and they're so incredible. And I wanted to show their talent and all the things that we've been through in this business. How long have you all known each other? Oh, well, some of us have known each other longer than others. I've, I've known, oh my God, I mean, I've known Marina and Rachel for 21 years, I think. Um, Fortune, I've known for years. Eliza, we, we haven't worked together a lot, but I'm a huge fan and, uh, and have met a bunch of times. And Sherry, I, I met, I did a, something with her on The View um, and she's just amazing. I just, it's, it's been a long time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, you can tell that there's a lot of talent here. And Andrea, can you uh, just talk a little bit about your experience coming in? I, I was just going to say that that, uh, that that one of the things that intrigued me was the fact that um, that Jessica had this coterie of women. But of course, once we start talking about women in comedy, there's a much bigger net that we wanted to cast to talk to people who were not necessarily just part of 
this intimate group, um, among them Eliza, who was out here in, in, uh, in California, kind of rocking it on her own, um, among, among other people who, who we've talked to in the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that I actually wanted to just um, discuss a little bit more, because the world of stand-up is so broad and varied, and then when you bring it into female stand-up, it has such a history, and so many people have been unsung through the years. Um, and it must have been a challenge to decide how you wanted to, what the parameters for this documentary were going to be. Because whenever, as a consumer, and if you're a comedy nerd, people, there's a tendency with any subject to say like, well, why didn't you bring up, why didn't you feature this person? Or why didn't you feature this region? So can you talk a little bit about the parameters that you um, set just in terms of what you wanted to feature and, and, you know, and, and whether you were able to get all of your dream folks here? I will say I do feel like we we have an extraordinarily dreamy cast, uh, and we wanted to make sure that we were getting a variety of different people's experience um, in, a, in 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 um, all manner of ways. So uh, so that was really important to us. We um, we asked a lot of different people, and uh, and when we hit a certain number, we knew there was no way that we could tell this story, um, and so then we had to kind of ha shape it and 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 keep it to a to 15, which is a lot of people to cover, a lot of stories to cover. And, um, and I think we did a very good job of getting a multitude of stories, a multitude of ages, a multitude of regions that people came from and experiences that they had coming into comedy. And, and when we had discussions in the beginning, there were people I said have to be in it just because I, I, I knew I, I just, you know, first of all, I mean, there's so many women that I know how strong they are, how they kill on stage and that they should really be seen. I, I didn't, I didn't want it to be such a cast thing. Like, you know, you have to get this many new people who just started and this many, I really wanted it to be the funniest people. Um, so I had gone to them with a big group and then as we spoke and went over it and Andrea spoke to people and and uh, we decided who would be in it. One of the things that I really love about this documentary is that it does reach back and look at some of the first performers in the game talking like Moms Mabley and you know even like Phyllis Diller and of course the great Joan Rivers and 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 so many others and I'm really curious to for anybody to kind of talk about um, on the panel just like who are your inspirations um, were you were you aware of like say the moms Mableys and you know the folks who are you know working working way back in like the 50s and 60s and and did they inspire you and um and and who really kind of inspired you to get into this profession i would say the moms Mabley, i i really didn't discover unfortunately until i started doing stand-up mm -hmm. that's when i learned about her actually it was a lesson but wanda sykes which is also in the story here was really who inspired me to speak the way I speak on stage. I, for me, it was Karen Johnson, uh, known as Whoopi Goldberg. And I remember she did a one woman show and she had all these characters and I couldn't stop laughing at these characters. And I knew of mom was Mabel because my parents used to listen to her and Red Fox and Rudy Ray Moore, but it was Whoopi who, kind of solidified uh, for me, like, she's really funny and she's strong. Like she's got a voice, I wanna, I wanna do that. I loved uh, Tracy Ullman growing up. So I watched, uh, I love that show. And I didn't really understand that like you could do stand up without writing like a, a clean joke punchline for a while. So seeing people that were like storytellers um, made me realize, oh, I can do this. I, at first, I just kind of thought I was a fraud because I can't write a clean monologue style joke. I admire that skill. I just don't, I don't have it. So I, I love storytellers, like, and people that kind of reveal weird, gnarled, humiliating things about their lives and stuff. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I grew up, I grew up watching uh, reruns with Carol Burnett with my grandmother. And that was a really big influence on me. She wasn't stand up, but she, you know, delivered a monologue. She did the sketches, she talked to the audience, there was a lot of improv. And my grandmother was really buttoned up, very uh, proper Southern woman. And then I would see her just lose it watching Carol Burnett. And I was like, oh my gosh, I wanna, I wanna make my grandmother laugh like that. So I think that, you know, really stuck with me. What about you, Eliza? Uh, 
Okay, I didn't know if it was going to Jessica. <laughs> this is like such a women's panel. We're like, you go. If it were guys, we'd just be eating each other's faces. Um, I'm trying to think back. I, for me, it was always a lot of black comics, and it was a lot of it was the women of the '90s in SNL, and then a lot of Chris Farley and a lot of Adam Sandler, and a lot of that energetic kind of movement and I didn't really study stand-up at all I just knew that I had done sketch and I wanted to say something on my own and I was a huge sketch fan and so I always took the irreverent stuff and the weird stuff and a lot of cartoons as well so that all fed into it um never even saw I feel so left out and never even saw an episode of Carol Burnett uh <gasps> growing up and so yeah it was just me like watching Martin <laughs> alone <laughs> in my like divorced mom's house and so it was always sketch and uh, dynamic characters. And uh, then when I got a little bit older, I heard Pablo Francisco and just the voices and that color and that texture. And then I kind of just stopped watching stand up because I never wanted to steal anything. And so I just get inspired by everyday people, I guess. I love Martin too. That was the Yeah. I love and Martin. like the Jamie Foxx show. And, <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. I mean, and that's so just, you know, you're growing up and you're just a little, you're just taking stuff in. For me, Kids in the Hall yeah. was huge. Um, and the women of Saturday Night Live, Sherry O'Terry and Molly Shannon and Anna Gasteyer and those women who don't, who really changed the way that we deliver jokes for about a decade. He's up there with like Jim Carrey. They don't get as much credit. Um, but we all did those impressions and stuff like that. So those were big mm -hmm. formative things for me. I'm glad you brought up Sketch. One mm -hmm. of the things I was thinking about when I watched Hysterical is that we have such a representation of people who work in stand up. You know, Sherry, you've worked in talk and done game shows. Or Marina, I've, I remember you from um, the nightly show and, and seeing you around and also your stand up. So, you know, we have such a variety here. Fortune, seeing you in different shows, same thing with Rachel. And I'm wondering if it made me curious to figure out like, mm -hmm whether women who get into comedy were initially more inspired by sketch shows and seeing mm -hmm. other female comics, you know, for instance, I don't know if you grew up watching I Love Lucy, I got into reruns, I'm not that old. <laughs> um, but, but I'm wondering if, if that was more of an inspiration for, in general, for female comics versus a lot of times my first my first exposure to male comics were on you know Richard Pryor listening to records you know the, the mm -hmm. Eddie Murphy you know listening to Eddie Murphy or seeing you know raw listening to Chris Rock so so those kinds of things I, I'm wondering if there is if, if you have ever discussed it, if there's a difference and whether that kind of formulated um, your personal style like were you did you, was your first exposure really to audio stand-up or actually kind of seeing it in the context of sketch or, you know, or comedies like Martin? I can say that that is my entire, um, everything I've done, the reason why I started stand-up was because of sketch, was because of Lucille Ball and Carol Burnett and Saturday Night Live, the women that they, you know, just described. Mm -hmm. That is the only reason why I became a stand-up comedian, because I never was like a fan of stand-up either. And I never watched any stand-up comedians, but I just wanted to be funny. And I've always incorporated all of those, you know, like I do a lot of characters and a lot of faces. That that was totally my influence was those women. See, you could be like, uh, like heinous. I was yeah. like, oh, I don't, you know, the goal yeah. be to try to look pretty. And that was like so exciting for me on, you know, to watch that on TV, to watch sketch first for sure as well, because I didn't study or know about stand-up, but just seeing these women weren't afraid right. to be like buffoons and be heinous. And, and the first, their first goal was not to try to be appealing, um, you know, or they would, they could be slovenly and fun. And I was like, I'm a sloven, great. <laughs> I also think echoing that, you know, it's only now that we're older and that we are people like, uh, people in stand-up that uh, people look up to that we have to reckon with the whole female aspect of it. I don't want to speak for the women here, but I imagine they maybe felt the same way. It never occurred to me that I wasn't just like the Monty Python characters I was listening to. And I wasn't just like Adam Sandler and Chris Farley. I related to them because this is before, you know, you're a girl growing up. And so maybe feminism wasn't really a discussion as much at the time where you were from. And so I never saw the difference. And because I thought they were funny, I knew I was funny. It never occurred to me that we weren't the same. And it's only now that we're having to put it in the context of men versus women. But the truth is when you're up there as any of these women can attest to, 
Like funny is funny. Mm -hmm. And we, when you are actually funny, people get over the fact that you are a woman very quickly for better, or for worse. So I don't think I ever saw myself as, oh, I'm a funny woman or I can't do that. I'm like, of course I'm going to do that. Cause mm -hmm. I'm just like these guys. I think I, I grew up watching Lucille Ball, Carol Burnett, uh, uh, Flip Wilson. And I, I, this is why I'm a comedic actress because I always liked that kind of stuff. But when I started stand-up comedy and went to the comedy store for the first time, I didn't know that there was something called Second City or the improv. That's right. really the route I would have wanted to go to. Somebody just said you take stand-up classes, which was a different format of, you know, premise setup punch. <clears throat> that is what I learned. But I so love getting on stage as as I've evolved and telling a story and knowing that it's okay if it's silence and owning that silence and telling the story. And it doesn't have to be a ha ah, at the end of my joke just getting there in the mm -hmm. in, in like the last five mm -hmm. years being comfortable of not yeah. having a punchline yeah i think improv is a very good way to enter comedy because uh, when you look at stand-up it can be pretty daunting where you go i don't know how to write a joke i don't know how to do that but improv seems like a way where you you learn how to make it up uh, on the spot like with friends and so for me when i moved to la I immediately joined the Groundlings because I was like, oh, this is how I can learn comedy. The stand up part just seemed so foreign to me. And it was through getting comfortable on stage through improv that I finally got the confidence to try stand up. So for me, it was very much a, a bridge to that, the improv. I would say for me, it was more of like um, looking back at how I discovered it. I really didn't know. I was bored a lot. And so I would listen to Richard Pryor in audio form. I would listen to Eddie Murphy in audio form. And I went to see Raw at the movie theater, not to, that says my age, but still, you know, I would see Raw. And so that's how I was informed about stand up comedy. But I didn't know that's what I wanted to do until I graduated from theater school. And I didn't, get parts doing what I wanted, you know, and I, I had my own voice. I just wanted to be on stage by myself anyway. So, so improv in theater school informed me how to be funny, but I was never like an improver because I could never accept what someone gave me in an improv <laughs> improvisation. They would give me something. I was like, no, I don't, I don't agree. <laughs> like, no, but. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it's really for me just being on stage. You you learn after a while what really shapes you as a comic on stage. It wasn't something that you just kind of like, okay, this is it. You said you didn't want to give away your age. I said Flip Wilson. So if that doesn't <laughs> <laughs> I said Lucille Ball. I never so. <laughs> when I see comics who I'm 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 always at uh showcases at groundlings or second city i love it so much i wish that i had gone that direction just not knowing about it but i am such a fan and when i see people who have that improv background i go where did i go wrong with my life i love it so much the other thing about stand-up also is it's like it's kind of like you're you do have a lot of control in a certain way even though there's yeah. some vulnerable aspects of being a comic and being on the road and our you know the weird rancid life we've chosen on the other hand, it's like, it's like, I think a lot of comics were lawyers once, not me, but like, you'll see that, <laughs> but uh, I have no education, but uh, it's kind of interesting because it is like, it's like your final argument to the world, you know, like your closing, <laughs> like all the nonsense that gets hurled at you in life, all the weird foul experiences you have, yeah, you have a funny. place to immediately like spew it and hopefully, you know, help other people who've gone through, you know, the similar nonsense. So it, it is like weirdly cathartic. And what Sherry, you were saying about like being vulnerable, not being afraid of those moments. It took me a long time to feel like that on stage. Like it, when I watch old videos of myself, I'm just like so frantic and desperate and just chasing that laugh. It took so many years for me to just be able to like relax and maybe reveal something.
I'm going to bring up another part of the film, which is um, someone observing that they never, and I think it may have been you, Marina, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, saying I never truly experienced sex of, sexism until I entered the world of stand-up. What, because, like I said, I come from a theater background. I went, was in, you know, I got a master's in theater. Not really. I didn't finish. But still, <laughs> um, I, got, I was attempting a master's in theater. And in theater studios, you're hugged up with your theater partners. There could be guys, you gotta be open, you touch each other, the space is safe. So then when I started doing stand-up in New York City, I was still doing that. And then I found out real quick, oh no, this space is not safe. You cannot be touching, <laughs> you know, another male comic and it's, it, yeah, I learned real quick, it was different. And then the fact that I couldn't get on stage, a lot of times it was because I was a woman. I, I had just done Last Comic Standing and, and then I would go and try to get up and every guy would be put on and I was still not put on. So yeah, it's a hard lesson, but I, I figured it out. So what does that do to you as a performer, both in the moment and long term? Um, just in terms of how you are able to get your comedy in front of people, what kind of energy that gives your comedy, um, whether it's like those first moments where you're just trying to get up on stage and, you know, being pushed back, but then you finally get there. Like what, how exactly does that kind of impact your vision and, and your presentation as a comic? Or does it? You know, I, I think... Every generation of women helps the next generation and makes it just a little bit easier not to take anything away from anyone else's struggles. You know, um, I can tell you 15 years ago when I started, um, I don't know, I think it was just kind of this accepted sexism that you almost at the time, like there's, you weren't even as aware of it. Like some of it was pointed and some of the men were horrible, but it was just kind of, you were so in the mix. And the more successful you become, the more you're able to be like, like I, somebody, I'm doing a show this week and somebody sent me a flyer and the song was Sexy Back and I'm, it's my show. And I was like, I didn't even, I wasn't even nice about it. I was like, do me a favor, take that song off the flyer. I'm not here to be sexy. And he was like, oh yeah, my bad. What song should I use? And I was like, literally any song you would use for a normal human, you know? And so there's less of fucks given as you get older and there is wanting to be part of it and wanting to be in it. And when you're younger, you're just kind of going and going and for the longest time, it never even clicked that they were saying like, she's funny and hot. And you're like, yeah, I guess those are good things. And then you get older, you're like, that's not my objective. And who the fuck are you? And so I'm gonna get up here, I'm gonna murder and you can go back to hosting at the laugh hole for the <laughs> next six weeks. Like it becomes this sort of like, okay, I'll just show you. And then we'll see how smug you are. Coming up, I did all of the black comedy clubs, all in LA, Compton, Long Beach. And it was a struggle because the way they would introduce me was this girl got some big old titties. Mm. And I'm like, take it. <laughs> you know, you got to go with it. Mm. I don't have any power to say, that's not how I want you to refer to me. You know, right. going up, it, it, I, I joke with a lot of the female comics, the black female comics, because the Me Too movement didn't exist mm. in stand up comedy. It's comics that would be you know, going, Sherry, I got a punchline to that joke you did. And me, naive, I go, yeah, what? And they had a penis out. It just was such a struggle. I am so yeah. like Liza that I'm at this point where it's like, none of that bullshit. I'm, I'm not even having it. Um, and we're, I'm not going to have it with the other women that that uh, are on the bill with me. So it ha it has truly been a struggle in the stand-up world as far as being a woman, but it has made me much stronger. I used to do clubs where I'd be there all night and have to get back to my legal secretary job. And Marlon and Sean Wayans would walk in and then I'd be there another two hours because they would do it and I'd have to take the bus home. But I stuck it out because this is the only thing I know how to do and it's the love of my life. So it's made me a tough cookie. You know, I, I felt like even when I stood next to the stage, it's like, don't screw with me. Like I give off an energy, like don't even try it because you're going to be in big trouble. Like I just kind of took everyone by the balls and was like, I think you have to have that as a female comic. It's like, 
I think a lot of people knew not to screw with me. Um, and if they did, I would go right back at them. It happened a couple of times in public with some male comics and it was brutal, brutal, but I went right back at them. And and I, I literally walked after a huge comic at Caroline's on Broadway once and followed him from the kitchen all the way to the bar area <laughs> with my finger in his face saying, don't ever fucking talk to me like that. I mean, he was shocked. You but, gotta let him know. They're like yeah, dogs. That, I ju they are. They're dumb. And I had to literally do that. And then I think it just got around like, don't screw with Jessica because <laughs> I just... I think it helped me. They respected me. They saw me as one of the dudes, you know, like. Mm -hmm. It's uh, such I, a fine line, like, because what you're talking like, I that resonates with me. But like, you're a nice person. Like, you're not. Uh, it's when you're a girl. I've definitely gotten this feedback, like, uh, you know, a random dude, like, I met her once. She was a bitch, and I'm like, or counterpoint, right? You were weird. Mm -hmm. I didn't suffer fools, and so therefore, because I didn't blow you. I'm a bad person. Like there's nothing, you want to be friends with everyone and show up and drink great. There's also nothing wrong with being like, I came to play, I came to do my job. You be nice to the wait staff, nice to your fellow comics, and then you leave. Like, there's and it's okay of, to have that vision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of, like a lot of my favorite comics too are angry. And I feel like <laughs> anger sometimes is also hilarious. It's like, it, I, I didn't even know I was allowed to be angry, but angry can, can be funny as shit. <laughs> And you have to call them out on their nonsense because it's also absurd. Like people will go, I headlined before and the comic hosting that's opening for me gets on after me at the end of my set. And he's like, she was a dirty birdie. He like, so oh. me, like I was a naughty <laughs> little, like I was a naughty little kitten. Meanwhile, it's like if a male comic went on and yeah. said the same words I said, you wouldn't call him a dirty birdie afterwards. <laughs> well, you discuss a variety of subjects as a female comic, your family, your vulnerability and relationship. But if you mention sex, all of a sudden, like, she's a nasty little godless whore. And it's like, how about I just talk about sexuality? You wild moron. And when I started, I would have gone up and not said anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? But like, I went back up on the stage and I'm like, and I mocked him for five minutes and it felt good because sometimes anger, I love to watch people that are angry. Well-placed anger is hilarious too, you know? So I feel like stand-up has given us permission to do that. I think for, for you know, the sexuality part of this that, mm -hmm. that really affected me and trying to be safe in this space, I purposely dressed down. I was never sexually, like sexual on stage because I was afraid they wouldn't take me serious. And I was so envious when women like Amy Schumer came along and owned their sexuality because I never felt I could own my sexual. I dressed in like overalls and the same overalls. I didn't change those. I mean, I look, someone said I needed a shower. I think someone said I looked like I had uh, dirty underwear. <laughs> and that was on purpose. <laughs> You know, so it was intentional. And I look back at that and I go, wow, the effects of that, you know, being in a, a boys club of the effects of that on me was so, uh, it, it's traumatic looking back. It's, it's not as easy as saying I was this and I overcame it. And it was really like looking back, it's trauma because, and like I said, like I'm, I'm actually older than Amy. So when I saw her coming up and I was like, like Eliza was saying, like the younger generation, the older, we're informed by each other in just so many layered ways. I think um, uh, going off of you, Marina, that's how I was in the comedy clubs. They, they had crisscross out, the crisscross colors and, you know, and I would wear really big clothes so as not to because I, I I wasn't one of those ballsy like fuck you I was so vulnerable and I was really I was a freaking Jehovah's Witness so I and, and then stepping onto the stage doing stand-up I wanted people to like me I was in my 20s and I you know meeting all these people and I was such a nice girl and I didn't like it when they talked about my body but I didn't know how to combat it on stage I used to get so many hecklers about my breasts and I wore clothes so that I was sexless. Yes, so yes. that you, and I always felt like I had to prove myself because it's always men on the bill and maybe one or two comics. And I had to prove myself. And I wasn't like, I came up with Cheryl Underwood, who's on the talk. 
and she was like, fucking, I'm gonna stab your ass. And I'm not that kind of person. <laughs> right, right. You know, I didn't even have a knife. Like, I didn't even know it. And so it was hard for me. Probably only in the last five years have I owned my sexuality. And mm. I will walk on stage in my six inch stilettos and something <laughs> that I love. But it was a long time for me to do that. And it was really, it was, you know, because the moment you showed any kind of sexuality, you had some comic on you that wouldn't let up. Certain like compliments that are backhanded, like people will be like, oh, you're like one of the guys or whatever. After shows, every female comic I know has gotten yeah. that where people come up after the show. And like, and for women too, unfortunately, they'll be like, I usually hate female comics, but you're great. It's like, why do you have to throw your entire sex under the bus? And how about just like, you're a great comic. People great remind comic. us that we're women way more than we're thinking about being women. Yes, yeah. Every time I do like press on the road, people are reminding me of that by one of those like questions or like, they'll be like, you're funny, like one of the guys. And I'm like, can, can I be funny? Like one of the girls or one of the humans? Or just so the my humans? closest friends yeah. are, you know, are, or female comics and, and other women. And I, I never had that goal that I need to be one of one of the guys. Like, why do I have to just throw my whole sex in the river <laughs> to just be funny? Like, fuck that. Yeah, I don't think I knew any better. I started stand up at the comedy store and I grew up with two older brothers. So I just was like, oh, this is just how dudes act. So I had like a like sort of naive tunnel vision where I didn't even process it. I just like did my thing, high five people and left. And so it didn't even, I didn't even like think about that environment as far as, you know, being a woman. I was just like, ah, oh, I've got 10 minutes tonight. Great. High five. Bye. Yeah. So, you know, I, the, Bye. the stuff I experienced was more on the road. Like people that worked at the club being like, you're the headliner. And I'm like, yeah, here's yeah. my merch. Can you put it, help me put it out? <laughs> I just want to share an empowering thing. And I totally get, I won something very early in my career that set me on a different trajectory. So it's easy for me to be like, just, you know, you're the headliner, don't take any shit because I didn't have to be in the trenches as long. So everyone's narrative is different. I was playing a club in Canada. This is a very long time ago. And the open, uh, the, the host couldn't get my name right. And I said to him, what I said to you when we were oh, introducing, people, introducing people, I said, you can mispronounce my name is totally fine. Just don't make a sh don't make a big deal out of it. I'm the headliner. Like, let's just not. And he gets up. And not only did he make fun of my name, he made fun of like being an American. He just went in on it. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And as they were bringing me up on stage, I grabbed the manager. I go, he's fired by the time I get off stage. And it, w it just felt like when you have it like that, if you do the littlest bit of power, I was like, I can't do much, but I can make you regret being an asshole. You know what I hate is when I'm on the road, girl, and still feeling like you have to prove yourself. And I'm headlining. I've sold yeah. this out on my name. And yeah. they'll give me a local opener. Yep. And I walk in the green room and it's him and all his damn friends in there. Mm -hmm. Your green room. Yeah. In my green room. You want to see you want to see me go ballistic. And they're in there, or I'll say, you know, I want my opener to be clean. I just want him to be clean. And then they got somebody who's, you know, so daggone nasty. I swear it probably was about four or five years ago and I was in Atlanta and I flexed that power and I went, get the fuck out of my green room. And, and yeah, I they walked out going, wow, she's such a bitch. I didn't right. care mm -hmm. because it was my green room. I'm headlining. I sold out this club. And I said the same thing, Eliza, he's fired. Like light him right now. Don't, he don't even get to do his time. He's off the stage. It felt <laughs> so good. The <laughs> former Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> <laughs> to I own think that, that I've worked really hard to be here and, and you're not the, yeah. because you think I'm just some little nice girl because you see me smiling all the time and it, it's not even just the green room it's also the opener that's a male when you're headlining tries to outdo you yeah. on stage before you I I it's like I've been doing this long enough to see that's what you're doing because yeah. uh, they just assume that you can't follow them and so, yeah, that's just, that's always been a challenge. I actually had to tell one guy, I said, and he started to do my material over the week. I said, look, what? you know, uh, I, I just want to remind you I'm the headliner. So and you're, you're starting to step into my material. So I need you to just think about what you're doing. 
And the response, the way they look is like, oh my God, I can't believe you're saying this to me. I didn't even know. I didn't know I was doing this. And it, it just adds these, to the, the experience. These male comics get so nervous. I mean, I was playing at the comedy cellar and, and this guy who was going to go up after me comes up to me. And this is a person who makes an enormous amount of money who's on TV. And he's like, leave some meat for the rest of us. And I, at him and I said, find more meat. <laughs> There's a lot of meat. Find it. I said, find more meat. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, and also I was going to say, I've been in a weird experience because I'm gay that a lot of these male comics have like done weird shit with me where they'll be like, hey, look, check out that girl's ass. Like they think that I'm in on it. With them. I have this thing where they all do this to me. They'll show me pictures that they get online. I'm like, I don't want to see a vagina on your phone. Like <laughs> it's, it's so crazy. That happens to me a lot where they think I'm another dude and like a male comic and right. it's, I have to say to them, this is not appropriate. I don't want to see any of this. Like, so I've seen it from a different angle too. It's frightening. The stuff that I've seen, like being on the road with some of these guys. You guys think there's more of a permission structure in comedy clubs for this kind of behavior than elsewhere in the world? Or do you feel like this is just definitely, oh I my mean, God. There's no regulating out in the road. You're like, in, you know, I mean, that you just hurl yourself to some weird city. I feel like a lot of us that have been on the road a lot, you know, sometimes I don't even look at who's picking me up. I mean, now, I'll, you know, like lately I learned to like ask for certain stuff ahead of time, but you, you just like turn your phone on, you have plain face and you just know you have to meet some guy and hope he's not weird and doesn't gently harass you on the way to the show. Uh, so yeah, they'll just send any sex offender to get us from anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I actually wanted, so I wanted to, I'm going to break in because that's a great segue to what I wanted to ask you about, you know, there was all this coverage in the wake of Me Too and how that was going to change the comedy world and, and all that kind of stuff. First of all, we're now aware in 2021, Are has we? it? <laughs> I know, I think. We, we, haven't, we haven't gotten you know, to do a show. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more, it's okay, it's more okay to call someone out just because someone's accused of something doesn't mean like you, uh, you know, it's an accusation, not a conviction. And so the pendulum is swinging one way and, and it is what it is. And that can be unfortunate, but I do think it's more okay now to stand up to a guy or to say something, this delusion that these women have, like, and he's so powerful. I'm like, he runs an open mic. Like, <laughs> give me his name. After we went through another round of this, I privately DM'd I didn't want to do it publicly because it always looks like grand thing, but I privately DM'd several women at the comedy store who are younger than me. And I just said, if you ever need help, let me know. Because I have no pro, I will burn a bridge if it's the right thing to do. And I think more women are okay with coming out about it and putting their foot down and say, and finding their power and realizing these guys are just random guys doing 10 minutes. They don't hold the key to your future. Um, and I think we've set the table to allow women to speak up um, and holding each other other men accountable i know that men are more i like from my opener hunter who i take when we do when we're on the road he's more likely now to be like hey dude that's not okay that you're saying that about a woman and i think women i'd like to think i know that if i hear something a girl did my first thought is i'm not sharing that let me fact check that before we like slut shame a girl or say that she's bad it's like let's Get these facts. I think women, while we may not all be best friends, we, we're a little bit wiser. Sorry, that was very long. <laughs> I think it's, up, it's not long. It's I think it's up to comics like us who are further along in the game to really reach back and help these younger females. I think um, Eliza, where it's, I disagree with you a little bit, because in the clubs that I go in, it's not regulated in these stand-up clubs and on the road. No, and it's not. And so that's not the point, but like some of these younger girls are a little bit because you, when you look at the set list, you don't see very many women on the set list, unless it's freaking a girl's night. Mm -hmm. And they're so afraid that they won't get this time. They're so afraid that the comedy club owner won't bring them back if they're, if they are perceived as trouble. Because mm -hmm. if you got a bunch of guys going, oh, here she come again, all oh, with that book, then they don't get the stage time. And so I think it's really up to us to say like what you said, if there's any, cause I tell girls that all the time, if you have any problems, come and tell me, 
because I got a big ass mouth and they respect me, <clears throat> but I've been at it a long time. So I, I feel for, you know, I, I think more of these male comics are put on notice that they can't just say anything to you, but they, a, a lot of them will try it. So I think we got to gotta help out the, the young sisters is what I say. Now, I wanted to talk about um, one thing, and this is through a framework of what Marina showed us in the film in terms of finding inspiration in really, really difficult moments. And I, I've got to say, like, I've watched a lot of stand up and I think that women have been most effective with this. Um, Marina, you talked about how your, you know, you had your breast cancer diagnosis and made that part of your, uh, part of your set. Um, and I'm wondering if that is something that, um, that women are kind of more comfortable doing or is it tougher? I mean, we are in a lot of ways kind of acclimated culturally and also, you know, it, can, it could be just from our families, just in terms of kind of having more a, a closer and more almost towards public relationship with our bodies in a lot of ways, um, for good or, or ill. And, and I'm just wondering if that, you know, Marina, first with in terms of bringing it into your stand up, but also if anyone else wants to talk about that, like, is that something that that you feel that female comics maybe have more of a um, more of a very specific point of view about um, that kind of gives us a bit of an edge in terms of having these discussions, these larger discussions about health and body. Okay, so uh, that was a lot, but I know <laughs> it, it happens sometimes. <laughs> I'll try, I want to make sure I answer your question the right way, though, because I'll go off on something else. But I will say this: like it was, it was scary for me because, like I said in the beginning, I used to dress down, and like Sherry was saying, like I have large breasts too, so they would that would become the focus. So to talk about that was actually, I would say in this day and age, it was a little easier because of the Me Too movement and because we were so aware of feminism and what women go through on stage. So I felt the support from the audience. So I don't know if the younger comic in me would have been able to do that, but the mature comic in me had the tools to do it. Um, and in fact, after doing it on stage, it's, it's interesting. I'm talking about breast cancer and still a guy tried to talk about it after I got off stage and tried to one up the material. But what I noticed is he didn't have the tools. So it, it, it failed for him. So I would say the tools is what gave me uh, the courage to do it um, and, and made the material better. And I, I had some mentors. I had some friends, you know, actually I had some male mentors. Uh, Keith Robinson was the one who said to me, you know, you have to go on stage and talk about this while you're going through it or you will forget the stories and the stories will be, for, you, won't, you won't have the same material because it, it'll be forgotten. So that that is why I had the confidence and and it wasn't easy the first time i did it on stage it, i was scared as you see in the documentary i was very nervous about going on stage at the comedy cellar which is like you know every time you go on stage you feel like you have to kill and i was really trying very vulnerable material out and and that set was great i don't know if it was because andrea was there and the team was there and i had the support from upstairs but it was just it really, it worked out that night. I, I mean, my stories tend to come from my own personal experiences or growing up. And the when I was putting together my last special, it just all the jokes kept kind of going back to my journey of figuring out who I was and figuring out that I was gay. And uh, so it ended up sort of um, shaping the entire special about representation and how that matters. And if I had had it earlier, I probably would have come out a lot earlier. So I ended up using the platform that I had for my special to tell that story of how, you know, it matters seeing yourself represented in the world. I don't know that it was like a conscious choice, like, oh, I'm going to, I want to talk about something that matters. It just, it was just forming my joke. So that ended up being what came through. And then as a result, um you know people have said that seeing that material you know i got messages from a lot of parents that 
their kid came out to them or a lot of kids were like, I watched it with my parents and I, I watched to see how they reacted. And if they laughed then I felt it was okay to tell them I was gay. And so that, that comedy that we can have any sort of influence on people in a positive way like that, I think is very meaningful to a lot of us. And I don't know if women are just more aware of that or appreciative. I'm sure men are too. It just seems that that, that definitely seems to matter to the females that I know who are comic. I'm very aware of that. Like I try to talk about things that I think will help other people feel like they're not alone. And a lot of times that's a lot riskier and it's very, you get very vulnerable and it's, it's hard. I mean, you know, when I saw Marina, when I saw that in the movie, I was so impressed because, and I, you know, you saw Tig do it in her stand up to talk about something so serious and make it funny. I mean, that's so hard to do when you talk about something so heavy and, to, and Marina, when you got those laughs and it did so well. And I was so proud of you because I've, I've dealt with some horrible situations that I've tried to make funny and it's not easy, but I think that, I think we're just more empathetic, not all of us, but I think a lot of women are more empathetic. And for example, I have a daughter with heart disease. So I, I keep trying to talk about it because I think it'll help other people, you know, that are going through it, that have a kid with problem or whatever, if someone can feel like they're less alone. Yeah, I've um, had people come up to me after the show, tell me about a family member and thank me and say, I'm so glad you're making people laugh because we laughed through treatment too. Mm -hmm. So I'm so glad that you're showing that people who are going through treatment and going through struggle that they actually do laugh. And, and it's just the response that I get from that is, is better than any response I've ever had doing stand up. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that, um, get on stage when you're vulnerable, is when you, the, the funny, the most funny can come out when you're completely vulnerable, which is a hard thing to do on a stage with people who are judging you. You're not singing, I'll always love you 12 times and making people cry. You, you're putting your vulnerabilities out there on a plate and going, love me. But I know for me, talking about my son who has special needs was the hardest thing to do mm -hmm. on stage because I'm such a protective mother bear. But to get on stage and talk about this boy having special needs and how hard it is and anguishing it is to deal with it and make people laugh, it brought me to tears at the comedy store I'd done the main room when so many people came up to me and said, I have a son that has autism. I have a son that has Asperger's, my daughter, and you made it okay to laugh at this because yeah. it's so heavy and nobody understands. And I just was like, you know, shit, that's what living in your truth and those vulnerable places are where you're going to get the freshest comedy. Well, it's also, I always say that the comedy gods reward vulnerability, you know, and it's hard because we're all so guarded, whatever, but the more honest you are, because then you're actually seeing someone for who they are and people can relate to that, whether it's cancer or your child or your upbringing or whatever, and you're you're coming out and you're just being honest about it so that other people can see themselves in you. Um, you do get the most out of that. And I think even removing sex from it, you know, Marina was talking about like having the tools to do something. You sometimes aren't ready to talk about stuff until later. And it is being able to do it in that funny way, like you're all saying, and being able to make it relatable. And also part of you, it comes out of you. You cannot be successful in stand-up comedy for that long without being authentically yourself. We can all start telling the same types of jokes, but the ones that succeed, like you have that point of view and the more you become yourself and the more experiences you had and the, have, and the more you're fearless in that, not because you're like, I'm a woman, I need to say it, but because it's your truth and it just comes out. I had a miscarriage a couple months ago and I was like, I did a tour because we couldn't play theaters because people don't believe in science. So we're doing a drive-in tour and I'm in the middle of a field in Illinois and everyone's tailgating. And I just decided to tell the story of my miscarriage and the bullshit it was and the bad healthcare and all this stuff. And it's all these people who maybe don't vote like me, maybe don't look like me. 
and I said it not for them, but for me, because comedy is inherently extremely selfish and we're supposed to market it as like, we want to help people, but we do this for ourselves. And I didn't, ex I thought they were going to be like, no one wants to hear about it. Take your liberal ideas. You had a miscarriage or something wrong with you. The amount of women who came over afterward and they were like, I've had four. I know what you're talking about. The amount of men who were like, we've been through that because you take that chance. I'm sure you saw that with your cancer. You take that chance of being like, I got to say this and I chose to find the funny and it has to come out because this is where I am in life. And this is authentic to me and what I'm experiencing. So I always believe no matter what it is, you're allowed to make fun of it because it's yours. I, I, I felt the same way. Like when I, I, uh, had a miscarriage too, and I was like looking up stand up about it because I tend to just relate to comics so much more than than anybody else, you know. But like, what a fun I, Google search. Yeah, it was a really fun, loving moment for me. <laughs> just like, <laughs> um, yeah, it was just sort of like feeding and weeping, and like, oh, can I just find a bit about this? But uh, but it helps. Like, it make you feel less. It makes you feel less isolated. And yeah. at first, like, I tried to do material about it, and I couldn't quite figure it out. And uh, other things that have been really scary for me, I've been able to find better stuff with, but there's a weird, like vulnerable period that a joke has to go through, especially when it's so personal. Mm -hmm. And it sometimes it just bombs for a while. So, you know, like when I was watching Marina doing some of her breast cancer stuff at the stand, and it was like crushing and it was so funny. And she was doing it in the middle of like, it was just like a very normal lineup and show and like some people just kind of doing dumb, normal, you know, lowbrow shit. And then she got up and made that work. I knew that it had to have gone through that weird pubescent stage that that kind of material has to go through. It's like, it's like this awkward teenager for a while. And sometimes people will see you in the middle of saying something like that, something dark or weird and be like, that's not funny. Like, and I've been, you know, like had people really close to me get that. Like, yeah, I don't think you should do that thing. But a comic will know, keep pushing it. It might've bombed yeah. to me. It might've been more strange than it was funny. But the, the bits that have like slowly become my my favorite are always the ones that had to go through that weird, like strange acne period before they became. Yeah. Male comics do this too, by the way. Sorry, I know you're wrapping up. I'm just saying like the apology tour or you know, Kevin Hart talking about his misgivings and his relationship. We all know Dave Chappelle is super personal, Chris Rock, I'm trying to think of white comics. Uh, but men do this too. You know, it's not just women have these bleeding hearts. My opener. Yeah talks about almost dying in, yeah, in a mudslide and being overweight, you know, it's nice to see that vulnerability versus just what we have come to expect from comics. But that takes, I mean, when, when, as an audience, when you see us talking about these things, what you see is us practicing our craft perfectly because you can get a knock, knock joke anywhere, but to actually get a, a comic that shepherds you through that. Eliza, you know what's so funny is when you're on stage and you write, you have to go through the kind of gestational period of something that's so personal to you to because the ultimate goal is it has to be funny. At the end of the yeah. day, it, it got to be Unfortunately. You can't yeah. keep talking about, uh, and I'm not bringing this up, but you can't keep talking about so-and-so died or something in a mudslide and then and go good night. So <laughs> no. the, the main point is- <laughs> I had a miscarriage, bye. Good night, everybody, <laughs> drop the <laughs> mic. Lost yeah. my baby. Um, you, <laughs> and I, I remember, uh, talking on stage about my husband cheating on me and having a baby with the other woman, which was so painful and led to a divorce and a big scandal and, and everything. And, and telling the audience about the fact that, you know, she had a child. And, and when I first started doing it, the audience was like, oh, and I was, and <laughs> I was like, okay, we, yeah, we, we gotta, we gotta I make want that. <laughs> You yeah. got to go back and make a turn here because um, I need them to be up and mm -hmm. really getting through that thing of now it's like, okay, now she's got a child and I got a child and they got it. They got to get along and finally getting the ultimate punchline. That is what feels good of it's, it's going from that gestational thing to fully formed, you know, where they are on the floor laughing, going, oh my gosh. This is so freaking funny. And but you don't know what I had to go through, all of the silence. Yeah. And oh it's like a breakup. For a while, you might just be like rocking and chain smoking weirdly in the window, and a joke <laughs> sort of does that too. And then it slowly becomes funny in its own entity or whatever. And you have to address it. I always address the oh, like I that's oh, my yeah. first bit about yeah. breast cancer or is like, you know, I like to see people laugh, you know. So I know people are gonna get sad and I 
thank them for laughing. Actually, I give them a little cookie at the end, like you did a good <laughs> job good for you. Well, I could do this and talk to you for hours. And I feel so grateful that you've all spent some time talking about hysterical and I can't wait for other people to see it. So thank you so very much for, for doing this. And it's going to be hysterical is going to debut on FX on April 2nd. And I hope that everybody takes a look at it. And I can't wait to go back and see all of you back in the clubs. And oh, we can't wait for that too. laugh in person with you. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you.